the solid ground the nations rise and fall the kingdoms once strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of Jesus oh we trust in the name of Jesus, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Every knee will bow We bring our expectations Our hope is anchored in your name The name of Jesus Oh, we trust in the name of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder 
Oh, 
Lord's door was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who would come to the Father all restored. And the church of Christ was born. Good morning. Welcome to our online message this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm getting used to speaking to a camera because I'm getting feedback from some of you folks who listen in and watch. And uh, so I, I know we're communicating and I appreciate that. So thank you very much. You know, nobody ever makes a decision to leave the Lord or walk away from God overnight. What happens is we make many little decisions along the way, little compromises along the way. And those are the things that lead us to ultimately rebelling against God and walking away from him. Now, there are two ways that we can learn. We can learn through our own mistakes. I find that particularly painful to learn through my own mistakes. Or we can learn through the mistakes of others. And in the, the case of this morning, we're going to learn through the mistakes of Solomon, what he did and how he compromised along the way and ultimately turned his back on his God. I'm reading this morning from 1 Kings chapter 11. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. 
May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Compromise. Compromise will define as partial surrender. You, you can't compromise without giving something up. Now, we live in an age where politicians, for example, compromise. Or we think they should. Nancy Pelosi presents a, a proposition of $3.4 trillion. The Republicans come back with $1 trillion. You would think the compromise would be something in between, but both are digging into their positions, probably out of uh, mutual disdain for each other. There won't be or there may not be any compromise. But we can't compromise without giving something up. And if I compromise a Christian conviction, I'm surrendering part of a conviction that comes from God to believe what the world or what the flesh has to offer. And I become one step closer to all-out rebellion against God. So let me ask you a question this morning. What are you compromising on? Is it your personal purity? Is it your honesty? Is it your integrity or the truth? Satan tells us that all we have to do is give up a little bit. Just compromise a little bit and everything will be okay. But he's the father of lies and we can't trust him. He will tell you that you don't have to follow the word of God completely or that I don't have to follow the word of God completely. And he'll have us picking and choosing uh, different passages of scripture and have us looking at how other people obey or don't obey, and soon we'll be denying a sentence, or then we'll be denying a paragraph, and then we're going on our own way rather than going on God's way and pursuing God with all our heart. Solomon was one of Israel's two great kings, and he started out with so much. We're going to look at that in, in uh, just a moment. But he sowed the seeds of the destruction of a nation. And there was a tremendous consequence to his compromise that affected other people, including all of Israel and all of Judah. He started out so high, but wound up so low. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 to 14, we have the story of Solomon and Gibeon and God comes to him and speaks to him in a dream. We read, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Can you imagine if God came to you and said, ask, uh, tell me what you want. Tell me anything that you want and I'll give it to you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of ours? Solomon asked God for wisdom. He asked God for the wisdom to be a leader and to be a leader that God would be pleased with. And we read, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And God goes on to say, because you didn't ask for wealth, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because you didn't ask for power, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because you asked for wisdom, that pleases me, and I will give you wisdom. We read on in 1 Kings, 
that Solomon received great honor from the people of Israel and from other kings uh, uh, of other lands. We read in uh, chapter 8, verses 10 to 13, that Solomon saw the glory of God. The glory of God came down in the temple that, that Solomon had built. He prayed a great prayer in verse 23 of chapter 8, confessing the promises of God. In chapter 9, he has another appearance from God, and, and, and God offers him promises again that will uh, be true for the people of Israel if he will just be obedient to God. But Solomon fell victim to deception, and he fell victim to compromise. In chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 Kings, we read that Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh by marrying Pharaoh's daughter. He could have had any woman in Israel, but he compromised. He fell victim to the deception of compromise. It began innocently enough, a political alliance. It seemed smart at the time. Pharaoh's daughter would seal the alliance but Solomon had been called to trust in the Lord with all his heart and not to lean on his own understanding in all his ways to acknowledge him and let God direct his paths. Solomon wrote those words and Solomon didn't pay attention to his own words. He couldn't say that he didn't know better. Joshua had told the children of Israel not to intermarry with pagan peoples. Uh, the, Moses had told the people not to marry, intermarry with pagan peoples. Uh, Moses had told not to marry many people. And he, we read this morning that Solomon had 700 wives by political alliance. But Solomon gave Satan a foothold. And that foothold became a stronghold. How does a foothold become a stronghold? Let me go through this very carefully. First of all comes admiration. We look on something and we lust after it. It may be ambition that comes from pride. Uh, others live by alliances. Why shouldn't he live by alliances? He believes Satan's lie. He compromised, and if compromise is unchecked, it's going to result in association. What do you have your eye on this morning? What are you looking at this morning longingly? If it's not of God, cut it off. Get rid of it. After admiration comes association. He took Pharaoh's daughter into his household and began to develop relationships with foreign women. But God had called him to purity. God had called him to to set himself apart as a king and to set the people of Israel apart. God had warned him, and this is your warning today, it's my warning today, not to compromise on the things of God. After appreciation or admiration, excuse me, and association comes deep involvement. Solomon loved, it said, many wives. It's the idea of sensuality. He gave his heart to many wives, and they held, he held fast to them in love. He wouldn't give up. He wouldn't surrender to God. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. He knew that the Israelites would suffer. He had seen David's life and the suffering that had gone through uh, the people of Israel because of David's sin, but he had given himself over to possession of evil. He was led astray and his heart was turned from God. And what he had possessed, 700 wives, now possessed him. And he found himself sacrificing to the pagan gods himself. After deep involvement comes possession, then comes corruption. In verses 4 and 5, we see that he followed other gods. Ashtoreth, who was a Canaanite fertility goddess, 
uh, based on and, and worship of her was based on the sensual. Chemosh was the god of Moab. Moloch, the god of the Ammonites. Uh, the Ammonites would burn children uh, to gain favor and win prosperity from their, their god, uh, Moloch. But again, Solomon had written, trust in the Lord. Instead of trusting in the Lord, he turned to pagan idolatries, and some of those idolatries participated in wicked practices, including male and female prostitution. You see how corrupt this wise man had gotten? He had been completely corrupted at this point. This man who had seen the glory of God, this man who could pray with such passion, this man who could pray with such eloquence, who could be visited by God. Listen, we can't play with God. Be not deceived, the scripture says in Galatians. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Your actions, your doctrine may become warped, but the truth remains the same. Listen, God is not some deaf old man who's blind in one eye. He is the almighty creator God of the universe who knows all, who sees everything, and is all-powerful. Solomon invested in immorality. He invested in decadence. He invested in disobedience. This man who had seen the glory of God was now caught in the muck and the mire of sin. Listen, we, we can have our, our devotional life down, we can have our prayer life down, and we can think that we are doing pretty good spiritually. We go to church or we watch online. Uh, we have our religious performance down to a T and still compromise in our actions and attitudes. If we do that, then we're going to have to have a compromise that leads to corruption and will bring about collapse. There are consequences to compromise. The consequences for Solomon were uh, because of his deliberate uh, disobedience, uh, he would have enemies that would plague him for the rest of his kingship and that the kingdom would be torn out of his hands. The kingdom was split right after Solomon died. It was torn apart and it was never back together again. You say, well, that's not very loving. Well, here's what God says in Hebrews chapter 12. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. You say, well, I, I, I don't believe God is like that. I don't believe that God punishes. I don't believe that God disciplines. Let me tell you, if, you're, if that's your attitude, if that's your thought, then you're already in trouble. If I start thinking that way, I'm already in trouble. So what do I do? I turn away from the things that would corrupt me. Job says in Job chapter 30, verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look lustfully at any young woman. When it comes to moral purity, I make a covenant with my eyes. I'm 72 years old, but I'm not dead. Temptation is real, and it's real for all of us of one sort or another. Turn away from it. Repent of it. Throw ourselves on our face before Almighty God and cry out for, to, for forgiveness. Watch your life and doctrine closely, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.16. And by watching my life and doctrine closely, I can keep myself from falling prey to compromise. There are compromises that are personal, deeply personal, that have to do with our moral life. And there are compromises that are social, that we are bombarded with day in and day out. And I have to take, I have to take the things that I hear from the news media, from the radio, uh, talk show hosts, 
from the things I read online, and I have to run them through the filter of God's word. I have to let God in, in my uh, life and doctrine be supreme and, and be the one who leads and guides and direct me. I don't take my cues from Glenn Beck. I don't take my cues from Michael Moore. I take my cues from the word of God. And anything that anybody says, I want to run through the sieve, the perfect sieve of the word of God. Where are you compromising? Are you compromising in terms of what you watch on TV? Are you compromising in terms of what you, go, you do and say on social media? Are you compromising with who you're listening to and who you're believing without putting it through the uh, litmus test of the word of God? I'll tell you, the only thing that we can do is throw ourselves on our face in humility before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God, let me, let me have a life that does watch my life and doctrine closely and that filters everything through the purity of your holy word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning that we can learn from somebody else's mistakes. I thank you that we can learn from the mistakes of Solomon. And I would ask, Lord, that I would learn from his mistakes. I pray that I wouldn't compromise and that we wouldn't compromise on any good thing that comes from you. Lord, we are bombarded with temptation. I believe, Lord, in our media age, we're bombarded more than in the times of the scriptures, although they were evil times too. But I'd ask, Lord, that we would resist the devil and watch him flee from us, that we would humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and watch as you lift us up. In your name I pray, amen. God bless you and thank you.